Okay, Jet fans, Darrell Revis. Baby is off the board. The New York Jets select Makai Beckton, Louisville. Pressure just makes you go a little more. I kind of like pressure a little bit. The New York Jets select. Welcome to another episode of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics Dane Brugler. We're talking wide receivers on this episode. Juicy position, juicy subject matter. All Jets fans, all NFL fans love the playmakers. We're going to dive into them. But first things first, it's a matter of business. The Beast came out last week, which is Dane's Draft Guide. If you have not read it, it is over 260,000 words on every draft eligible player, like known to man, essentially. So with that being said, one, Dane, how do you feel? Have you caught up on sleep? You know, all things considered that it's draft season. And two, you got to hit us with like some of your most fun facts that you found as you were going and making this beast. Well, it, it was fun to you know introduce reintroduce myself to my family again. Uh, my kids have grown; it's been good to see them. Um, but no, it, 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 yeah, I, no, I joke. The only thing longer than the guide is the honeydew list waiting for me uh, now that I'm back in civilization. But you know, it's it, it it's been awesome the last week to uh, you know get all the feedback, um, all the messages about the guide. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a year, a year round process. A lot of information. Uh, is packed into this thing. And so, and, and I don't try to be wordy. Uh, I mean, I, I only include the, the relevant stuff. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, I take a lot of pride in the fact that the, all the pro day information's in there, uh, especially this year with no combine. So having the NFL verified pro day results for 600 players uh, being in there, that that's a big deal to me. And, I, and I'm glad that I was able to work out. Um, and, you know, I just, hopefully this is a resource for people. Uh, if you don't know, you know, a certain player who's drafted on draft weekend, you can, you know, turn to the page and the, in the guide that'll tell you everything you need to know about them. So uh, hopefully, you know, all you need is a subscription to the athletic and it's included uh, as part of it. So I think it's a great deal and hopefully people will check it out. But yeah, I mean, there, there are plenty of awesome stories. And it's really, that's my favorite part of this is learning these different stories, where these guys come from, um, you know, what, what's the journey that they took uh, to, to get to the NFL's doorstep because no two journeys are alike. You know, they all come from different backgrounds and challenges and things like that. Um, and, and it's fun to learn about them. And it's fun to include that in, in the guide. So, you know, a player like Zach Davidson, a uh, tight end from central Missouri who might get drafted. He was a, a, a punter only as a junior in high school. And, you know, he was thinking about not even playing as a senior because, you know, he liked punting, but he wanted to focus on basketball. The coaches said, you know, come on out, come on out. We'll let you try out at tight end. And he kind of liked it. And so he's recruited as a punter at Central Missouri, uh, at Division Two, And he goes to uh, Central Missouri because they said, you know, well, well, yeah, sure, we'll give you a chance to work out at tight end or just try it out. He goes to Central Missouri. He's, uh, he's the punter. They also let him try out tight end after a few years. And 2019, he was uncoverable. <laughs> 15 touchdowns and they couldn't do anything about it. So uh, six, six and a half, 245 pounds. Uh, not only are you getting a, a developmental tight end, but you're getting a, a guy that who could legitimately compete uh, to be your punter uh, on an NFL squad. So pretty cool position flexibility there. Usually you don't, you don't get the tight end punter uh, combination. It's tackle guard, corner safety. Uh, not, not often you get the tight end uh, punter uh, combination. Yeah. Would you consider that a first maybe? I mean, that is rare. Yeah. That is cool and unique. Well, and especially his story. I mean, there, there have been some tight ends who have I mean, maybe punted in high school, but, you know, they did it as a hobby or, you know, it was more of just something they did. Um, and maybe they could be the emergency punter. But, I mean, Zach Davidson, he was legit uh, first team all-conference punter uh, 2019. Nice. Uh, no, no 2020 season because of the pandemic. But, I mean, he was a punter first and foremost before he came a tight end, which is Right. I mean, you mentioned it like maybe people that pick up a hobby. I mean, Chad Ojo Cinco kicked an extra point in the <laughs> NFL. Exactly. I mean, th this is a you know, this is like the next step. This is the evolution of athlete here. And, you know, we're, we're going to dive into the receivers. There's some great juice in terms of background. If you mm -hmm. love the draft, like I consider myself an above average draft fan, like throughout the year. And there is so much juice that's packed into this beast. That's uncovered, you know, as I'm even just reading up on the receivers that we're going to talk about today. So if you're listening to this, if you're watching this and you don't have a subscription, I would highly suggest to get one. I would highly suggest 
to read the beast as much as you can. I mean, it's 262,000 words. It's a lot of words to get after in a couple of weeks here, but it is well worth your time. And with that being said, you know, I have one final question, actually. The beast 2022, is that like already started in your eyes or is that, you know, once the draft is over, then maybe you start compiling your list and go from there? Well, I, I try to, you know, knock down that honeydew list and things like that throughout, throughout May. And But, it, I mean, really, I've already started on it because when you're researching these guys, inevitably you pick up different things on players that maybe aren't in this draft class. And especially this year where we had, uh, you know, uh, it's like close to 800 players who took advantage of the NCAA ruling that you can have that extra year of eligibility. So plenty of seniors who had a chance to be drafted this year uh, will, are going back to school. And a lot of those guys, uh, you know, already did a lot of the background work, the information, uh, scouting. And so uh, ha, there, there's going to be more players in next year's class, but have a little bit of a head start on, on a lot of them because, uh, you know, they were, you know, we didn't find out they'd be taking advantage of that extra rule uh, until later in the process. Fair enough. And before we start the receiver talk, if I forget to bring up Jacob Harris at the end, just remind me because I have a question about Jacob Harris. So okay. now with that Got being it. said, let's dive into this. This year's class, well regarded as a deep class with elite level talent, similar to last year. At the top of this year's class, you got Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, and then you obviously have your depth guys. But why is that crop so good and really just what makes them elite players that project to the pro level? It, you know, I don't know. This is like the evolution of the NFL, but you know, none of these guys are built like Calvin Johnson or Julio Jones. You know, the guys that we usually think of when we we talk about the the no brainer, uh, you know, upper echelon prospects at receiver. Uh, you know, they're they're different in how they're built, but the impact potential that they bring is really really impressive. I mean, Jamar Chase, we didn't need to see him take another snap in, in college football to know what kind of player he was. He opted out this past year, but he still has a great chance to be the number one receiver drafted. He blew up uh, his pro day even better than I think a lot of us thought. Uh, you know, not not the biggest guy, just over six foot, just over two hundred pounds, but runs a four three four in the forty yard dash, uh, a three nine nine short shuttle. Out of every all the players in the in the draft guide, only two got under four seconds in a short shuttle. That's Michael Carter, the running back from North Carolina and Jamar Chase. Uh, so that short area quickness uh, is outstanding. Not only the long speed, but that short area quickness, really impressive. Um, you know, I, he, to me, Jamar Chase, the top receiver this year. And then you've got the two Alabama players, flip a coin, uh, going around the league, talking to, to different teams, you know, who, which is higher rated for them, uh, Jalen Waddle or Devontae Smith. Jalen Waddell, uh, more in that Tyreek Hill mold in terms of type of player. A uh, special athlete can create before and after the catch. And then Devontae Smith, you know, unlike a lot of receivers we've seen in the past uh, in terms of his body type, the way he's built, but his speed, his uh, his instinctive route running, his elite ball skills, he's just the outlier. He, he's, he's the guy that, you know, doesn't look like he should be as good as he is, but he is. And so it, it's going to be interesting to see how early these three receivers go. Do they all go top 10? Do one of these guys maybe slip out of the top 12? Uh, it'll be interesting to see ultimately where they end up. So it'll be shocking if one of those guys is available at 23 for the Jets. Yeah. With that being said, who are some players at 23, even 34, that could be options for the Jets if they decide to add to the wide receiver room? I think there are two names here that I wanted to specifically uh, talk about. And it's first Rashad Bateman, um, you know, from, from Minnesota. You know, he was kind of a late bloomer in high school. Uh, he start once he started to really become productive uh, in SEC teams. Uh, really started to take notice as a senior. Minnesota was already in there and had that relationship, and so Rashad Bateman stayed true to that uh, commitment. Uh, goes up to the Big Ten, becomes a Gopher, and he was really productive uh, at Minnesota. He, uh, as a sophomore, as a 19, had over 1,200 yards, 11 touchdowns. He tested uh, as an above-average athlete, but I don't know that you necessarily see that all the time. He doesn't necessarily always play like an explosive athlete, but his route savvy is NFL level. You know, it's that Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas style where he doesn't always look like he's blowing past uh, corners uh, with just pure athleticism, but his ability to uh, leverage coverage and, you know, create that separation just based off of uh, body movement and hesitation – 
and uh, you know the, the the ability to lull defenders to sleep. He has that, and that's something that's going to really make him you know hit the ground running in the NFL. Uh, it, w- with whether he's asked to you know line up inside outside, he can do either. So I think a lot of teams would be interested in Rashad Bateman, what he could offer. And then Elijah Moore. Um, I don't know that he's even going to make it to the Jets, uh, you know, pick 34. He might be off the board in the first round. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, if you for a lot of the same reasons you like Jalen Waddle are the same reasons you're going to like Elijah Moore. Five, nine and a half, 178 pounds, not the biggest guy, but, uh, you know, he can fly. Four, three, five in the 40 yard dash, um, 36 inch vert, six, six, seven, three cone. Uh, he, he was force fed the ball in that Ole Miss offense, Lane Kiffin. He knew his best player was, and he did not let up. Uh, you know, he, he led FBS in catches per game with 10.8. Uh, a lot of it was underneath stuff, but there were times where you see him uh, work down the field, uh, you know, give him a simple, you know, a sluggo route or a vertical route. He can do those things. He can track the football, outstanding hands, uh, creates before and after the catch. So with Elijah Moore, you have a home run waiting to happen. And so because of that, it, there's a good chance that if the Jets were – if they wanted to draft him, they might have to do it at 23. You know, you mentioned both of those guys, and both of them have very different yet interesting profiles. But between the two of them, given the way that the Jets wide receivers room looks right now with Denzel Mims, Corey Davis, Keelan Cole, Jamison Crowder, do you feel like Elijah Moore – if both of those guys were available would be the better fit in this jets wide receivers room. And also this jets offense as a whole. And the question, I think when you look at just the makeup of that wide receiver room, um, you know, Elijah Moore is a guy that you can, you know, line him up in the back, in the backfield. Uh, you know, he, he's very natural from the slot. You, you watch him at Ole Miss and he was it, it, it lined up differently on every single play. Uh, you know, a lot of jet sweeps, a lot of screens, a lot of slants. Uh, they really found unique ways to get him the football. And a lot of it was underneath. A lot of it just get him the ball, let him do something. Uh, because he plays so fast. He plays so decisive. Uh, and so, you know, he does need to become a more well-rounded receiver just in terms of, uh, you know, putting more on tape uh, on, you know, the intermediate uh, part of the field. But, you know, everything that he puts on film, you get excited about. Strong hands, controlled route runner, very athletic. He's that flexible chess piece that you can line up across the formation and, you know, he's going to be productive for you. You know, you mentioned Bateman and I'm thinking like, as I'm reading the description that you've laid out, I'm thinking like, who's a similar receiver? And you're mentioning Keenan Allen and Michael Thomas. And this is just a general question. Last year's wide receivers class, very talented. Jerry Judy at the top, Mm CeeDee Lamb, Henry Ruggs. But then there was Justin Jefferson who went after those guys. He ran, I believe, a 4-4-3 at the combine. Bateman ran a 4-4-1 at his pro day. But are first of all, are they similar at all? And, And second, is would you peg Bateman as maybe the most likely guy to go in that 20? to 35 range that could emerge as being one of the best receivers or one of the better ones from the crop at an early stage in his NFL career? It's certainly possible. And I think that's a great, uh, great comparison to make um, just in terms of, you know, we had the big three uh, last year with, uh, yeah, with Judy and Ruggs and Lamb. And then, uh, you know, Justin Jefferson was a fifth receiver drafted and he ended up having an historic rookie season at receiver because in a big part was he was NFL ready. Um, and you know, the, the, the situation he was in the Vikings were, you know, uh, trading Stefan Diggs. they had the situation where he could step in and kind of take off. So where Rashad Bateman ends up, you know, that will obviously play a big factor in his rookie production, but because he is so savvy with his routes and he understands how to leverage coverage. Absolutely. If he goes to the right spot, you could see him maybe being the most productive rookie from this class. That's, that is not uh, something that you look at and say that's impossible because he has the ability. And if he's in the right situation, uh, you, you could certainly see that coming true. You know, before we get into some round three prospects, I'm curious from like a philosophical standpoint where you stand. We've mentioned before Kyle Pitts and uh, the history of tight ends drafted in the top 10. Well, if you look right. at the history of first round wide receivers in the top 15 taken compared to the back half of round one and round two. And even, you know, beyond that, 
history says, well, you maybe you're better off in the back half of round one or maybe round two to get a receiver. You mentioned Michael Thomas, second round pick. DeAndre Hopkins, 27th overall pick. I mean, there's a laundry list. So can you make the argument for the other side of that and the top half of the first round and the guys like Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, why are they special enough that they would deserve that kind of pick? I think there are several teams. You look at the Bengals sitting there at number five. I, I, I think that's a team that's having this exact debate right now. Uh, you know, they have a chance to draft Jamar Chase at number five, most likely. Uh, and if they do reunite him with Joe Burrow, add some firepower to that offense, I mean, that's awfully appealing. But does it make more sense to go with a 20-year-old offensive tackle from Oregon, Penny Sewell, or Rashawn Slater and upgrade the offensive line? Because, you know, theoretically, it has been easier to find that wide receiver uh, in the second, third round as opposed to an offensive lineman. So I, I, that is something that I think is going to come down team to team. They're going to have different philosophies on that. I think you have to look at the players in, in the top five and really ask yourself, OK, are these guys true difference makers? Uh, or is this a Julio Jones who's going to come into our uh, facility and completely change uh, you know, how defenses look at us and how they're going to play us. And if you if you say so, then, yeah, by all means, draft that receiver there. But if you're saying, well, there's not a huge drop-off between him and maybe who we can get in the second round, okay, well, maybe then you, you lean towards uh, a different position if you have them ranked similar. Um, now, if the receiver is your highest-ranked player, go get your receiver. But if you have a similar grade on Jamar Chase and, say, a Penny Sewell, if you're the Bengals, me personally, I would probably lean towards the offensive tackle in that scenario. So, but each team is going to look at it differently uh, based off what they're looking for, uh, you know, how their roster makeup is. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a great point by you to bring up because it's the exact conversation that a lot of teams are having right now. And it will be fascinating to see how it all plays out April 29th, Thursday in Cleveland, Ohio. It's really just a couple weeks away, which is amazing, fascinating. It's one of those things where it's like, you know it's around the corner, but it's a long two weeks. So with that oh, being yeah. said, the Jets have two picks in the third round. So can you give us two players, two wide receiver prospects that you think could make sense for the Jets? Well, when we, as we look at it, uh, it, we kind of set it up. It's a very deep year. So I think there could be you know more than a few that they look at. But two that you know maybe stand out as making sense, uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, a uh, three-year starter at USC, he was, uh, you know, coming out of high school, really hyped as this polished receiver uh, who's going to come in, five-star guy. And for the most part, he lived up to that. Uh, now, I don't know that he necessarily uh, is that upper echelon type of impact player, but you just know what you're getting. You have a strong, strong-handed strong player. Um, he is very refined with his movements. Uh, can get better as a route runner, but very polished. Uh, you know, he tracks the ball well. Uh, you know, he was a high volume uh, receiver at USC. Not a guy that's a speed demon. He's not going to just blow by uh, uh, corners, but he's highly competitive. You love the body control. Uh, just a very dependable target who can line up inside, can line up outside. Uh, so he, he could be a, a guy you can play the X, can play the Y, can play the Z, can mix and match him up and down, uh, you know, your offense formation. And then if they're looking for more of a speed threat, a, a guy who's really going to test defenses deep, Tutu Atwell um, at, at Louisville. This is He's a player in the Marquise uh, Hollywood Brown mold where he's, he's, he's tiny, you know, 5'7", uh, 155 pounds, but he can absolutely fly. High school quarterback, um, so, you know, still learning the position in, in some respects, but good luck covering him. And so if you're talking third round, maybe that's where you take a swing on a player like this who is going to stress out the defense uh, because they have to respect that speed, both vertically and horizontally. So uh, a guy that needs to get more reliable and, you know, more drops than you want to see. Uh, but when you have that speed, it's just, it's special. And so at a certain point in the third round, that becomes a player you're looking at and saying, okay, yeah, he can really help our offense. You know, the two, two at well discussion, I think is going to be fascinating. You mentioned Hollywood Brown, if you're drafting Tutu Atwell in the third round, let's say in this hypothetical and you put him on the field, you probably know it's a pass play, right? I mean, that, like, I guess my question is, is this, you have Rondale Moore, who's maybe around the same height, maybe an inch shorter, but 30 pounds heavier, both blazing fast. Why would you not take, let's say Rondale Moore in the first or second round compared to Tutu Atwell in the third round? 
Yeah, well, and I think that's the, you know, we talk about wide receiver value. If you you know, want to address the offensive line and, you know, your cornerback position, whatever, earlier, you know, and you want to wait on your receiver, you can wait until uh, the third round. Because, again, I mean, Tutu Atwell is, you know, there's 5'9", 155. Again, not big, not, not a, 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 a matchup player when you talk about size. But he's a matchup player when you talk about speed. And that's where, you know, if, if you can get him in the third round, you know, the, the value uh, is what you're looking at. And so, uh, you know, the Jets had a pretty good uh, uh, pretty good pick last year out of Louisville, so maybe they could do it again. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see Makai Becton stand next to Tutu Atwell. I would Talk love about to contrast see uh, from the same school, <laughs> those two guys. Yeah, that, that two, two guys from the same offense two years ago, and uh, you couldn't get you know, too much different than that. Yeah, I know. I, I mean – I have this uh, this vision in my head that you know maybe maybe two two Atwells on the outside, Makai Becton comes comes around trying to get a second level defender. Two two Atwell might be collateral damage if he you know <laughs> he ran into Makai at some point. Right. <laughs> but yeah. with, with, with that being said, I do want to ask you about St. Brown because it, everything that you've just described says to me that he's a solid player, right? Mm-hmm. That, like, everything about him, he's just solid. He's competitive, but he's not. He doesn't have necessarily the flashy traits it kind of sounds like a poor man's version of Michael Pittman, like not the same traits, but just a solid all around player. Is that a fair assessment? And what is, what is St. Brown's ceiling? Yeah. And I think that's uh, kind of, that's kind of what we're talking about. I don't know that he has a high ceiling, but we feel like he has a high floor. Uh, You know, you, you feel like you know what you're getting with him uh, because he is a solid route runner and dependable pass catcher. Very aggressive. I love his blocking. That's one of the, the, you know, when you're watching tape on a receiver, uh, and you're getting excited about his blocking, he's doing something right. So uh, the tracking skills, the instincts that he brings, all things that translate, and so easy to like him. I, I, I like Michael Pittman a little more because he's a better athlete. He's a much bigger player, uh, more home run potential to his game. Um, but with uh, yeah, you're right in terms of along the lines of being just being a reliable player. It just comes in a smaller package with uh, St. Brown. Right, and that's why I think we're talking about St. Brown as maybe a third-round option compared to Pittman being a mm-hmm. second-round player last year. And, you know, I do want to say in the Beast, this is one of the best facts that St. Brown was named after the Egyptian sun god. I mean, you know, a little teaser here. Mm-hmm. You know, go to the Athletic, go get the Beast. So He's fluent in three languages. Yeah, he yep. he, he attended, uh, what was it, fourth grade in Paris. Yeah, there's a lot of right. – it's an interesting family. You know, his brother, Equiminius, is a uh, wide receiver with the Packers. Uh, you know, his dad being a, a former uh, Mr. World bodybuilder. His, his, his mother's German. So just it, – it's a really fascinating family and – uh, you know, there, there's one more actually a wide receiver at Stanford. So, uh, yeah, really, really interesting player. You know, when you mentioned St. Brown's blocking ability, Denzel Mims or rena- oh, not renowned, but he's his blocking solid Corey mm-hmm. Davis also known as a good blocker. So I wonder if maybe we've seen one of the few indicators of what Mike LaFleur is looking for in an offense. Obviously he inherited Denzel Mims, but Joe Douglas obviously still in place. So we'll see what happens come draft day. You've given us round three options. How about a day three option for the Jets? Well, and this is a player that once you get into rounds four and five, uh, this is a player I'd be looking at to target, and that's Simi Fajoko uh, from Stanford. 6'4", 220 pounds, um, really productive this past year uh, at Stanford. Uh, in six games, he had over 500 yards receiving. Um, it, he, uh, he also blocked a field goal. So, you know, special teams, that's, that's where, you know, from day one, uh, you know, you're not sure where he's going to fit in the wide receiver depth chart, but he's going to help you from day one on special teams. That's a huge selling point. Um, I don't, not the most natural hands catcher, but he has such a large catch radius that he can go up and get the football uh, tested really well. Four, four, three in the 40 yard dash, um, you know, under seven seconds in the three cone, which is really impressive for a guy that size. Uh, he, there's just a lot of things you can do with him. And once you get to the fourth, fifth round, you're looking for those types of traits. A little bit of an older player, um, you know. He went on a religious mission um, after after graduating high school. Uh, so technically, he's only a redshirt sophomore at uh, 23 and a half years old. But you know, he's a player that I think he's, you don't think he's too far from contributing uh, to your to your offense. And like I said, day one special teamer, and that that's a big selling point as well. All right, I love it. That was the wide receivers talk again. Playmakers, juicy fans love receivers, and you know I love receivers too. Why not? 
So with that being said, let's head to some fan questions. And we didn't get a lot of questions. We just got a lot of players that I think fans want to hear more about. So, you know, let's start with this guy or two guys, rather. I think, no, they definitely were both senior ball guys. Dwayne Eskridge, is he a good fit for the Jets? And how about Demetric Felton out of UCLA? What do you think about him? Well, Eskridge can fly. Uh, again, not a big guy, 5'9", 190 pounds. Uh, he was a big-time track player, uh, a track runner in, uh, in high school. Uh, won states in 100 meters, 200 meters. Uh, as a senior, uh, you know, growing up in uh, Indiana, uh, and then you saw that at the Senior Bowl. You saw it as pro day. He ran in the four threes. Uh, and he's a guy that can catch the ball away from his body. He's not just a, you know an underneath threat. He can move down the field uh, and make plays. So uh, I think he could be a mismatch weapon. if you're. He's, he's another one of those receivers uh, in the third round where if you're looking for speed, you know, in that 2-2 Atwell conversation, uh, Dwayne Eskridge fits as well. And Demetri uh, Felton is interesting because he's, Maybe in that, uh, you know, wide receiver, running back, which one is he uh, type of conversation. Uh, Naheem Hines with the Colts, that, that kind of reminds me of that type of player. He was recruited as uh, a, uh, a wide receiver, uh, but he moved to running back uh, for UCLA, and they kind of went back and forth, weren't sure exactly where to play him. So, you know, he had over, uh, you know, uh, 600 yards rushing this year, but he also had – uh, 22 catches and then he goes to the senior bowl and he's running routes like he's been doing it his entire life well he has been because he has been uh, a running back and receiver he's been uh, moving back and forth so he's just a guy you want to get the ball in his hands um, you know he a lot of you saw a lot of quick hitting routes on on tape at UCLA and that Chip Kelly offense um, a lot of yak opportunities uh, he's also going to help as a return man so he led the Pac-12 last year in all-purpose yards per game with over, I think it was 165. So there's a lot you can do with a player like this. And he's another one. Once you get to the fourth, fifth round, you're looking at Demetri Felton as, okay, is this going to give us maybe that shot of adrenaline uh, in our offense? Maybe a guy we can, you know, work in as a uh, slot receiver slash, uh, you know, uh, change of pace running back as a do-everything type of player. That's Demetri Felton. All right. So this is what we're going to do for the second question. I'm just going to say some names who have been in my mentions here, and you can talk about whoever you want, okay? A lot of people ask about Frank Darby. We've talked about him before. A lot of people mm -hmm. ask about Dax Milne. We've talked about him before. Elijah Moore, we've talked about him. Now, a, another Moore, Rondale Moore, we kind of talked about him in this episode. That name comes up a lot. Same with Kadarius Tony, And then the other guy is Anthony Schwartz that comes up a lot because obviously we know he's fast, but that's all mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people know. So out of those three, take all of them, take one of them, take none of them up to you. Well, let's start with Anthony Schwartz. Uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. He's fast and that there's a lot you can work with right there. Uh, he, I mean, literally one of the fastest humans uh, that we have in this country. Um, he in, in high school, I think his best in the hundred meters was a 10 Oh seven, which you know, is just flat out fly. Anything under 11 seconds is flying. And he got almost under 10 seconds. So uh, back into high school, he was, he was the track athlete of the year. Um, nationally, he competed uh, internationally. So there's a lot you're getting with this player in terms of speed. He's just, he's, a, he's an unpolished uh, player in terms of being a polished route, route runner um, in terms of, uh, understanding how to set up defensive backs, how to stem, how to uh, release off the line of scrimmage, all these different details that it takes to play the position at a high level. He's just not quite there yet. And, you know, I, I, I was kind of disappointed that, you know, for a player with all his speed, he didn't have a ton of big plays on his tape. Uh, you know, you look at, it's a lot of feast or famine. It's either a big play or it's a minimal gain. So uh, of all his catches in college at Auburn, only 9.4% of them resulted in a play 25 plus yards or more, which, you know, for a guy with that speed, you'd expect a little bit more um, out of shorts. So he's still growing into the role. Um, he's not a well-rounded receiver right now, but again, the speed is rare. The burst, no defensive back wants to face that. So Anthony Schwartz still going to be drafted. He might still, I haven't graded as a fourth rounder. He could go in the second round just because a team who is just after that speed uh, you know, they feel like they can, uh, you know, get the rest out of him. So don't be surprised at all if Anthony Schwartz ends up going on day two, although I think that is maybe a little bit early for him. 
Um, you know, the other receivers you talked about, uh, it was Rondell Moore, uh, a player that you have to go back to the 2018 film to really get a feel for who he is as a player. Played in four games in 2019 before he got hurt. And then, uh, you know, this past year, you know, it, it's really hard to evaluate. He played in three games, but hard to really get a sense of, of who he is as a player. Um, so as long as you're comfortable with the medicals, uh, because he did miss some time due to injury, Rondell Moore is an easy player to like. He's just so electric. He's, he's small, or I should say he's short. He's not small. Because he's 5'7", but he's he's pretty stout. He's 180 pounds. He'll break some tackles. Um, he he was flying at his pro day 4-3-1 in the 40 yard dash. Um, you know he's under he was 6-6-8 in the three cone. So again, short area quickness, long speed, really twitchy athlete. Um, a lot you can do with him. It's, it's just he is a small target. And so uh, if you have a need for that type of receiver, Rondell Moore in the in the top 50, top 60. I think he's going to make an offense better. Um, and who was the third receiver you asked Kadarius about? Kadarius Tony. Kadarius Tony, who I, you know, he is the human joystick. Uh, six foot, 195 pounds. He also ran in the four three. I think everyone ran in the four threes. It's crazy. The amount of speed <laughs> I ran in the four draft. threes this this pre draft process. Yeah, I want to see video evidence on that. Uh, yeah, well, with, I'll, I'll talk to some guys. <laughs> uh, with with Kadarius Tony, he's he's still more of a gadget player than he is more than a polished receiver, but he's on his way. I mean, he's getting better and better. And so I, I think as long as you're convinced that he is on his way, you're going to look at him in the top 40 picks and be, you know, awfully intrigued with Kadarius Tony on your team. High school quarterback, uh, you know, he was actually listed as an athlete on the Florida roster all through his uh, four years at, in Gainesville. So, you know, he's still, again, more of a gadget player, but good luck. I, mean, I feel like every time you watch him, he's like saying to himself, okay, for my next trick, I'm going to, and then he just does something that is, just looks impossible uh, with the way he's able to eliminate pursuit angles or make these guys miss. He's got rubber joints. It, it's really something that's uh, bizarre to watch. So, uh, you know, just leaving missed tackles all over the SEC. So Kadarius Tony, as long as you're comfortable with him as, uh, you know, on his way, the trajectory to being a more polished player, and comfortable with the off field, then you're going to look at Kadarius Tony in the top 40 picks and say, okay, this is a weapon. Absolutely. We could use on our team. All right. That was great. You knocked it out of the park. I remember the Jacob Harris question without you having to remind me. So this is how we're going to wrap this up with Mike LaFleur. Now manning the offense. We don't know if it's going to be San Francisco, like green Bay, like because his brother is Matt LaFleur. We don't really know what it's going to look like, but Jacob Harris is six, five two nineteen. And this has me thinking, could this guy be like in the Rob Tunyon role where he's a receiver, puts on some weight, gets a little bigger, and then last year he pops off? I'm not saying Jacob Harris is going to have the season that Rob Tunyon had last season, but do you think he kind of fits that similar mold, that path that Tunyon was on from college to the NFL? Yeah, that, that's the mold. I mean, that, that's what you're trying to, to – that's the path that Jacob Harris will try to follow, and it makes a ton of sense. Um, uh, I, you know, I, he's one of my favorite, he is my favorite sleeper this year. Um, and I don't know that he's much of a sleeper anymore after his pro day. Thankfully, I, I came out with an article on the athletic, my top 10 sleepers, uh, the day before he, he blew up his pro day. Um, uh, but a, a fascinating backstory. We talked about, you know, central Missouri, that tight end, how, you know, his backstory, same thing with Jacob Harris, uh, coming from UCF, he was a soccer player his entire life. He didn't play uh, football until his senior year of high school. And that was just, you know, go out and have fun with my buddies. Uh, and then he goes to college, Florida Gulf Coast, to play soccer, and he gets that itch to go back and play some football. So he walks out at Western Kentucky. And he, he's a little homesick. He goes back to Florida, walks on at UCF, and gradually works his way up the depth chart. Finally, as a senior, he really breaks out. He has eight touchdowns, um, you know, more drops than you want to see. Uh, you know, he, he has hands like a former soccer player, uh, but he got better and better, and that's what you want to see. You want to see development. Um, and for a guy that's 6'5", 220 pounds, to go out and run a 4'4", 40 and a half inch vert, 6'5", 1, three cone, you kidding me? I mean, that's anything under 6'7", is remarkable in the three cone. But for a guy that's 6'5", 220 to 6'5", 1, three cone, that's Tyreek Hill, like three cone. So really rare numbers from Jacob Harris at the UCF Pro Day. Um, and another guy, we talked about Simi Fajoko, how, you know, there's some development needed, but he's going to help you on special teams. That's Jacob Harris. It's going to take some time for him to adjust and develop. Last year, or he can help on special teams right away. He had 10 uh, career tackles at UCF. So a guy that that's that big and can run, 
put him on special teams coverage. He's going to earn his roster spot. Once you get into day three, look for Jacob Harris to come off the board and I think has a good chance to be the first non-combine invite uh, to be drafted. We didn't have a combine this year, but we still had a combine list of 320-some players. Jacob Harris was not on there, but I do think he has a good chance to be the first non-combine guy drafted this year. And that is the perfect way to wrap up this episode of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics' Dane Brugler. Dane, we got one more position left before the final seven-round mock draft. We're almost there. Thanks for your time, and we'll see you next week.